What would it take for you to confess to a crime that you didn't commit? If you were like the vast majority of people, you would probably state that you simply would never do such a thing. That there is no amount of money, torture, or pain that you could be put through that would make you say you did something that you didn't. And the idea that you would is outlandish and stupid. Now, really think about it. If you were locked in an interrogation room, sans water, sans food, kept awake for hours on end, how long do you think it would take before you would begin to crack? For you to say anything just to be let out. How long do you think you would be able to put up with an interrogator who refuses to get you a lawyer, who repeatedly lies to your face, who threatens not only your life, but the life of your direct family, before finally telling him what he wants to hear? During normal, legal, ethically run interrogations, the interviewer slowly and methodically puts an exorbitant amount of pressure on the other party in order to gather information. They probe you for information and ramp up the stress until finally you confess to a crime you are being accused of. At the point of confession, the idea of being let out of the interrogation room becomes more appealing than one's continued freedom. So when the party does confess, it feels like a proper unburdening. There have been countless times of seasoned interrogators going into interrogations knowing the tactics that are going to be used on them and still falling for them, completely unable to maneuver themselves out of the line of fire. Sherry Rasmussen, Kenneth Blue, and more are all examples of this. And, notably in those cases, the interrogation is being run by people who are following strict guidelines and not breaking the law. So ask yourself again, how long would you last in that heightened, aggressive kind of interrogation before you confess to a crime that you couldn't have committed? Because in today's case, we know the answer, down to the exact minute. Welcome back to another episode of Dreading. Today we are going to be covering the case of Michelle Bosco and the miscarriage of justice that led to the imprisonment of the Norfolk Four. This video topic was recommended by a subscriber via our email, as so many of our topics are. And after looking into this subject, it's very apparent as to why. I personally had never heard of this case prior to the suggestion. And I feel like that alone is an issue. What occurred in this case should be common knowledge, especially in the true crime interrogation space. As always, if you like this video, give it a thumbs up and subscribe. If you have any other video suggestions, feel free to leave them in the comments down below, as I am always looking for new topics. With all of that said, let us begin. Michelle Bosco was a bright and beautiful girl who had the entirety of her life ahead of her. She had just turned 18 years old when she had secretly married and moved in with her high school sweetheart, Bill Bosco. In order to support Michelle and their future family, Bill joined the Navy and was stationed in Norfolk, Virginia. Michelle and Bill were wed in April of 1997 and had been married for almost three months when Bill left for a week at sea. The pair were still in the honeymoon phase of their marriage and Bill rushed home to see his wife. But instead of the woman he had just vowed to love and protect to the end of his days, he found a crime scene. Upon entering their shared apartment on July 7th, 1997, Bill found Michelle's lifeless body on the floor naked, covered only by a large black t-shirt. While he'd been out at sea, Michelle had been strangled, stabbed, and sexually assaulted. Upon finding her body, Bill ran to his neighbors, the Williams, and told them what he had found. Like the Boscos, the Williams were a young married couple in the Navy and were equally devoted to each other. Upon hearing about the attack, Daniel Williams jumped into action calling the police, then rushing over to the apartment to attempt to provide aid. But Michelle was past the point of saving. The police arrived quickly and cordoned off the scene. Barring security cameras catching an assault, a crime scene can explain a lot about what happened. The majority of the apartment looked untouched, as nothing was out of place in an alarming way. There didn't appear to be a struggle in any part of the apartment, save for the bedroom, which indicated that only one person had been involved and it was clear that it had been a frenzied attack, rather than one carried out over a long period of time. Because Bill had been away at sea, he was ruled out immediately, and based on the fact that there didn't appear to be any forced entry, Maureen Evans, the detective put in charge at the scene, determined that the attack had likely been carried out by someone who knew Michelle, and she had willingly let them into the apartment. Fortunately, the killer had left DNA evidence at the scene, meaning that all the police needed to do was find whoever matched the DNA, and they would have their killer. The case should have been cut and dry based on the evidence alone. One person who knew Maureen in some capacity had gained entry into the home, sexually assaulted her, and then stabbed and strangled her. She had fought back against this person, but the assault had been quick and brutal. Those were the facts of the case. However, those facts would almost immediately be disregarded to make way for the police's non-evidence-based theories. While still at the scene, Maureen talked to a friend of Michelle's, Tamika Taylor, who also lived in the apartment complex. Maureen asked Taylor what she believed happened, more specifically, who she thought could be behind the attack, and without missing a beat, Tamika pointed to Daniel Williams. 
the neighbor who had called for help. According to Taylor, he was obsessed with Michelle and harbored an obsessive crush on her. This was not even slightly true, and why Taylor was adamant about this was unknown. Stranger still is the fact that Taylor did know the actual murderer and had brought him over to the Bosco apartment mere days before the attack. Or at least, that's what the police alleged, Taylor said. In 2005, Tamika signed a declaration stating that when she spoke to the police, she told multiple officers another name when they asked her who she believed killed Michelle. She repeated this name to multiple officers and informed them that he was already in trouble with the law for violently attacking a woman the month before, and that this person had made it a habit to stop by Michelle's house every day saying he was looking for Taylor. Despite the viable lead, the officers had already made up their mind, based on a suggestion from someone outside of the case and no evidence, led to seven innocent men being accused of this crime, as well as four false confessions and one of the most notable miscarriages of justice that I have ever stumbled across. Daniel Williams was a 25-year-old naval officer who had just married his longtime girlfriend, Nicole Williams. The month prior to Michelle's murder, the couple had excitedly thought that Nicole had gotten pregnant with her first child, only to be rocked by the news that she actually had ovarian cancer. Despite the diagnosis, they remained hopeful that she would be able to beat it and they would start their family soon. The couple was already engaged, but moved their wedding date up in order to get Nicole onto his naval insurance so they could afford treatment but everything would change dramatically just 11 days later. When Maureen Evans approached Dan after talking with Tamika Taylor, he thought she was just fact-checking the situation. He had been the one to call the cops at her husband's behest. He had been one of the first witnesses to the crime, and he was their next-door neighbor. It would make sense that they wanted to bring him in in order to go over the timeline and see if he had heard anything strange. He had no idea that Maureen had already decided that he had committed the crime. That day, he was set to go over to his family's home for dinner, so he let them know he would be over in a couple of hours after talking to the police. But those couple of hours would turn into a full decade of his life. After about an hour of questioning why he was the one to call the police and not Bill, and why he entered the scene and tried to help Michelle, Maureen dropped the bomb on him and let him know that they believed he had been the one to kill her. Dan was shocked. They outright accused him of being sexually obsessed with his neighbor, a woman who they had barely known. When he rebuffed this and reminded them that he was married, they blew him off, telling him that that didn't matter. He was obsessed with Michelle and had broken into her apartment to finally be with her. They battered him in that interrogation, telling him over and over that he murdered Michelle due to his psychotic obsession with her. But Dan remained steadfast. He knew it wasn't him. He loved his wife, and he had never laid a hand on Michelle. Anytime he rebutted their arguments, they would twist his words to imply that he had either just admitted to being obsessed with her in some backwards way, or they would ignore his statements altogether. Eventually, they asked him to take a polygraph test in order to prove his innocence, and he quickly agreed, stating once more he had nothing to hide. He hadn't done anything, but his resolve was beginning to fade. No one was listening to him, and it seemed that everything he had said just made him look worse. Within a couple of hours, Dan had completed and passed the polygraph test that they had provided for him. However, as most people know, a polygraph test isn't an actual indicator of if a person is telling the truth or not. It's an indicator of stress, and there are countless reasons as to why certain questions can cause stress. Polygraph tests can also be hacked in a way, by simply doing breathing exercises or being on certain medications, but they aren't an actual indicator of if a person is telling the truth. They are not admissible in court as evidence, and are mainly used as an interrogation tool. Usually, the police will use a person's willingness to take a polygraph test as an indicator of their guilt or innocence. If a person has something to hide, it can be assumed that they will deny the polygraph test, but if a person is willing to take it, the investigators tend to view them in a different light. However, there have been countless cases in which a person has agreed to a polygraph test even though they are guilty, making the entire use of them and law enforcement questionable at best. Despite Dan passing his polygraph, when Maureen came back into the room, she stated that he failed, and he needed to tell them the truth. Maureen continued to interrogate Dan for eight hours, yelling at him, telling him that he had killed Michelle, taunting and belittling him, then stating that if he confessed, she'd be able to help him. She just needed to hear what he had done, and then she would let him go. And for those eight long hours, Dan fought back. He remained adamant that he loved his wife. He hadn't broken into the Bosco's apartment, and all he had done was call the police for Bill. Dan hadn't been arrested, but he wasn't allowed to leave. He was being unlawfully detained, and despite him asking multiple times to speak to a lawyer, he was denied. And so, after eight hours, Maureen finally gave up. She didn't let Bill go, though. Instead, she brought in Detective Robert Glenn Ford. 
in all papers, articles, and coverage of Detective Ford that we were able to find, he is characterized as a bulldog. He was the person who got results quickly and effectively because he refused to get them ethically. He had a reputation in the force of being someone who could get anyone to confess to anything, regardless of if they had done it or not. According to his peers, if you wanted to get a confession, all you needed to do was tell Ford what you wanted the suspect to say, and within a few hours, he'd have them signing a confession saying what you had told him, word for word. Seven years before the murder of Michelle Bosco, Detective Ford had been involved in another case known as the Lafayette Grill murder. While investigating, Ford was able to obtain a written and signed confession from three teenage boys who had nothing to do with the case. Through his intense interrogation style and feeding the boys information about the crime in order to make their confessions make sense with the evidence at the scene, Ford was able to frame three innocent teens for a crime they didn't commit. Ford had been disciplined for this by being temporarily reassigned to uniformed duty and taken off of homicide investigations. However, after a few months, he was returned to interrogations and then went right back to collecting false reports. To be clear, his superiors and peers were aware that Ford had garnered false confessions in the past, but despite that, would regularly call him into interrogations to elicit a confession. They admired and praised his abilities in an interrogation room, even though they were illegal and often led to innocent people being put into prison. The most recent reports of this case and others that Ford worked on where he gained false confessions, people have emphasized that Ford was acting in what he believed to be the best interest of the public, that he truly believed that the people he was gaining these confessions from were in fact guilty, and therefore the methods that he used were justified. However, that could not be further from the truth. Ford, as well as the rest of the Norfolk Police Department, willfully and purposely overlooked evidence for various cases in order to make the crimes fit the person they wanted, instead of the person who actually committed the crimes. Instead of taking the evidence as fact and using that to build their case, they ignored it completely, or tried to force a narrative that would make no sense. Ford didn't genuinely believe that the people he was questioning were guilty, given that all the evidence said otherwise. He just didn't care about it. You cannot be fighting for justice to be served, then knowingly circumvent that justice. Though the entire Norfolk Police Department was involved, the continued leniency he's gotten through some reporting is alarming. Dan hadn't been responsible for the murder, but that didn't matter. Once Ford entered the interrogation room, he wouldn't be allowed to leave without a signed confession. When Ford entered the interrogation, things dramatically shifted. Dan was now being told by another person that he had committed the crime. The evidence pointed to him and to him alone, and if he didn't confess, he was going to die. Ford emphasized that point repeatedly, telling him that he was going to be killed for what he did to Michelle if he didn't admit to it, that he would be able to help him if Dan simply stated what he had done. Dan had been denied food and water for over 10 hours, continuing to tell the police the truth. He hadn't killed Michelle, he loved his wife, and he had nothing to do with the crime, but after being hounded for hours by Ford, he broke. He told Ford exactly what he wanted to hear, stating that after Michelle had let him into the apartment, he forced her into the bedroom where he raped and killed her. He went further to say that during the assault, he struck Michelle multiple times with his hand in a shoe, and that was how she died. His story aligned with what police knew at the time, which was solely that the attack occurred in the bedroom of the apartment. Because an autopsy hadn't been performed prior to the interview, the cause of death had yet to be determined. So because Daniel didn't know the cause of death, he simply made one up. He was immediately arrested and charged with capital rape and murder. It wouldn't be until the following day that they would find out Michelle's exact cause of death. And given the disparities between the direct evidence and Williams' confessions, they forced Williams back into the interrogation room. Maureen Evans informed him that what he said did not match the direct evidence, and went on to tell him how Michelle had been killed. Exhausted and beaten down from hours of abuse, Daniel amended his confession to align with what Maureen had told him. And with that, the case was closed. Daniel realized his mistake immediately and wanted to recant his confession, but it didn't matter. As far as the investigation was concerned, they had caught the man responsible within 24 hours and celebrated that fact. Meanwhile, the person who was responsible would go on to beat and sexually abuse a 14-year-old girl a mile away from the crime scene. As Daniel sat in prison, awaiting trial, his DNA would be processed alongside the sample that was found at the scene. Prosecution and the police believed that the sample would affirm his story and prepared their case against him as such. But on December 11th, nearly six months after Michelle's body was found, analysts would tell the police that his DNA was not a match. 
All of the evidence in the case indicated that the attack had been carried out by one person, who knew Michelle in some capacity, and given the sample of DNA that was left at the scene did not belong to Daniel, the obvious conclusion police would reach was that Daniel was innocent. However, that would mean that they had elicited a false confession and imprisoned an innocent man for nearly half a year, during which time his wife had died. Instead of accepting the evidence and realizing their mistake, they determined that the DNA didn't match because Daniel likely had an accomplice. Despite all the crime scene evidence indicating that there had been only one assailant, they couldn't admit they had been wrong or that Ford had garnered another false confession. So they began to look at people closest to Daniel and found Joe Dick Jr. Joe was Daniel's roommate in the Navy and was described as a shy and sensitive boy. Like they had with his roommate, Joe was brought in to be interviewed by police in connection to the rape and murder only to be denied food and water and be told that they knew he was involved somehow. They told Joe about the case and went so far as to show him the crime scene photos, which traumatized him. They fed him pertinent details about the case, like where Michelle had been stabbed, how she had been attacked, and what Daniel had previously said occurred. That way his confession would match. Joe tried to fight the accusations and took a polygraph test to affirm his innocence, but like with Williams, it didn't matter. The results of the polygraph have never been released, for whatever reason, but Ford told Joe that he had failed, like he had done with his roommate. The results of the polygraph didn't matter to the police, as they had already come to their conclusion prior to him being brought in anyways. For all of those falsely accused and imprisoned in this case, they've described the continuing interview after the polygraph test as being where they began to consider confessing. Each party felt confident in their own innocence, and confident that the police would see the truth and let them go. But when Ford would walk in after, telling them they had failed and they had proof of their guilt, their faith in the system would falter. After being told for hours that they knew he had taken part in the crime, he too confessed. In his confession, Joe claimed that Michelle had let him and Williams into her apartment, where they both attacked and raped her. He claimed that the attack started in the living room of the home, and it was only after she was sexually assaulted that she was moved to the bedroom, which flies in the face of the direct evidence. Despite confessing, Joe still believed he would be able to walk out of the interrogation room a free man, given that he had willingly given his DNA to the police. He knew that whatever DNA they had found at the scene would not match his, and thought that once the police had processed it, he would get an apology and be able to move on with his life. But, like with Williams, the police weren't in a rush to test the samples, believing that they had once again solved the case in record time. It wouldn't be until three months after Joe's confessions that the results would return back to the police, exonerating the two men. And, just like before, the police decided that they couldn't have charged two innocent people with a crime they didn't commit. They were the good guys. They were solving the crimes and putting bad people away. Being wrong about Joe and Daniel meant that they had done something wrong, which was an impossibility. Instead, they determined once again that more people had to be involved with the murder, despite the crime scene evidence. Joe's lawyer, Michael Fascinero, was informed that the DNA found at the scene didn't match his client, and that the police believe more people were involved in the murder. From the time he was hired, Michael told Joe he believed he was guilty, and that his only job as a lawyer was to prevent him from getting the death penalty. When Joe told Michael he had given a false confession, the lawyer was waved him off, citing that even if that were the truth, no one would ever believe him. Seeing an opportunity for his client to strike a deal, Michael told Joe that if he were to work with the police and implicate more people, he could get less time. Initially, Joe rebuffed his lawyer, telling him that he was innocent and couldn't point the finger at anyone else. But when Michael spoke to his parents and told them Joe had 100% participated in the crime and convinced them to tell Joe to implicate more people, Joe began to sincerely believe he had killed Michelle. The term gaslighting gets thrown around a lot today on the internet, but the examples that are often used are flimsy at best. Gaslighting is defined as manipulating someone using psychological methods into questioning their own sanity or powers of reasoning, which is exactly what happened to Joe. Joe had been convinced by the Norfolk Police Department that he had raped and killed a woman he had never met. Any time he would provide proof of his innocence, it would be overlooked, ignored, and disregarded. All evidence that should have exonerated him was used as further proof he was somehow responsible, and losing his parents' faith in his innocence made him genuinely believe he had killed someone. Over time, Joe would give seven different statements to the police, implicating more and more people, and all of these statements would be false. The first person he would go on to implicate was Eric Wilson. Wilson was another sailor in the Navy, and a friend of William's wife. 
he stated that the trio of men went to Michelle's apartment and covered the peephole on the front door so she would open it. They then rushed into the domicile where they attacked her, carrying her into the bedroom where they sexually assaulted and murdered her. The details of the attack still did not match the evidence at the crime scene, and he changed who had stabbed Michelle multiple times throughout, but it didn't matter. The police wanted another name, and that's what Joe gave them. Eric would be brought in for questioning on April 8, 1998, where Ford would once again take control of the interrogation. For nine hours straight, Wilson was badgered by the detective, who told him they had direct evidence of his involvement, and that they could prove he had taken part in the murder. Like Daniel and Joe before him, Eric denied doing wrong, repeatedly telling the corrupt detective that he was innocent and would be willing to give DNA and take a polygraph test to prove it, but it didn't matter. Eventually, like Joe and Daniel before him, he confessed. But once again, when his DNA was tested against the DNA found at the scene, it was not a match. Detective Ford would interrogate Joe Dick once again. Joe, believing that he had taken part in the crime and no longer able to defend himself, would become a resource for the corrupt cop. He would pressure Joe, implying that there was more the young man knew and wasn't telling him, and Joe would buckle, believing the officer must be right. On June 16, 1998, nearly a year after the murder, Dick would tell Ford that three other men were involved in the attack, although he only knew one of their names. In this version of events, he claimed that all six men gained entry into Michelle's apartment picked her up, and carried her into the bedroom where the assault happened. He then said that each man took turns stabbing her in the chest after the rape except for Eric Wilson. This version of events was so far off from the crime scene evidence that there was no way that it could be the truth. When the scene was examined, the detectives noted that nothing outside of the bedroom had been disturbed. The apartment was small, and had six strangers been in the home all attacking Michelle, there would have been evidence of that. But, as established, the truth of what happened stopped mattering to the police the moment Williams had been brought into the interrogation room. The police were not able to find a George who matched Joe's description. However, based on the physical description Joe had given, they found Derek Tice. Like Williams, Dick, and Wilson, Derek worked in the Navy, which to the police meant that they all knew each other well enough to conspire to rape and murder Michelle. On June 18th, Derek would be brought in for questioning, which was again run by Detective Ford. After 11 hours, Ford was able to elicit another false confession, with Tice parroting the story that he had been told. Ford had given him every detail that Joe had made up, up to two other unknown men being involved, but Derek was able to fill in the gaps himself. He told Ford that two other men had also been in the Navy, and gave him the names of Jeff Ferris and Richard Polly. Both men would be arrested and charged with capital murder and rape. However, neither would break, with both men maintaining their innocence. Joe would be brought in to testify to the preliminary hearing for Jeff and Richard, and he would once again revise his story. He claimed that both men had been present at the time of the crime, but was unsure if another unknown man had also been there. When asked why he took part, Joe claimed that Daniel had threatened him, saying he would hurt his family if he didn't participate, and that Jeff Ferris had given him the knife, but he was unsure if he had stabbed Michelle or not. Both Ferris and Polly's lawyer would fight the charges, with Polly's lawyer providing proof that at the time of the murder, he had been on the phone talking to his girlfriend in Australia. They also noted that evidence in the case went against the police's theory of what happened. How could six, potentially seven men, have attacked Michelle and left no evidence at the scene? Why would Michelle have opened the door for seven people, most of which she didn't know? And why did the story of what occurred keep changing? Despite their arguments, the judge found that the police had probable cause to charge Ferris and Polly. Three days later, their DNA would be tested against the sample found at the scene, and once again, it was found that it didn't match either of them. Once again, the police had the opportunity to look at the case before them, look at the indisputable facts and the crime scene evidence, and write the course. It was unlikely that the attack was carried out by two people, but it would be impossible for six people to have carried out this attack. But again, instead of reassessing the case, they went back and talked to Derek Tice. Derek would name a seventh man as being part of the crime, John Dancer. Derek would directly claim that when he spoke to Ford, Ford was insistent that Dancer had been the seventh man. Tice denied this repeatedly, as Dancer had moved out of the area and could not have taken part in the attack, but Ford refused to let him leave without getting the result he wanted. Like everyone else, John would be brought in and charged with capital rape and murder, and be interrogated by Detective Ford. He maintained his innocence throughout, and went so far as to provide a rock-solid alibi. He'd been at work during the day, then went to a birthday party that night. His day was wholly accounted for, 
with multiple friends and co-workers affirming his version of events. He had moved to Pennsylvania, making it physically impossible for him to have been part of the rape and murder. But that didn't matter to the police. They just needed to find the man whose DNA matched the crime scene evidence. That way they could implicate all parties in the crime. According to the prosecuting attorney, their thought process was never, we got the wrong person. Rather, we don't have all of them yet. So even when they were shown direct evidence, it did little to change their minds. Following Dancer's interrogation, Tice was brought in once more to try and get more information from him in order to crack Dancer. Instead, Tice recanted his claim that Dancer had ever been involved and told the police that he was forced to confess and implicate another Navy officer. Despite John having a rock-solid alibi and being in an entirely different state at the time of the murder, he was still charged. Derek would be brought into court and forced to testify, where he once again stated that Dancer had taken part in the murder. Daniel Williams had been in prison for two years at this point, and everyone in his life seemed convinced of his guilt. He had lost everything in that time, and his lawyer, Danny Shipley, encouraged him to plead guilty to the murder to avoid the death penalty. With every new person implicated in the rape and murder, the police's theories got more salacious, and there was no doubt in his mind he would be sentenced to death if the jury believed he took part in the crime. On February 9th, 1999, Daniel would plead guilty, but less than a month later, there would be a massive breakthrough in the case. On February 22, 1999, Delvey Stover walked into the Norfolk Police Department and handed over a letter that her daughter-in-law received from an inmate. The letter contained a confession to Michelle's murder and had been sent by Omar Ballard. Ballard had met Michelle and William Bosco through a mutual friend, Tamika Taylor, the same woman who had pointed the finger directly at Williams. Ballard was a violent, abusive man who, at the time of the murder, was already wanted for a violent assault on another woman in the same apartment complex. Tamika would allege that she repeated Ballard's name multiple times to the police, stating that he had a history of violence against women, and he had made it a habit to show up at Michelle's apartment at night to see if she was home. However, it seemed that the police had already made up their mind about who was responsible for the murder at the time, so they ignored her. Omar's confession contained details that hadn't been made public, and he took sole ownership of the rape and murder. Days after Michelle's murder, he would go on to beat and rape a 14-year-old girl in the same apartment complex, and subsequently be arrested for the attacks. He pled guilty to both and was sentenced to 41 years in prison. When he was brought in, his DNA was taken and added to the criminal database. However, because the Norfolk police were so sure that Daniel, Joe, Eric, Derek, Richard, Jeff, and John had all been responsible, they never added the sample to the crime scene to the database for comparison, meaning that they could have solved the crime the entire time with the information they had, but they purposely overlooked it in order to preserve their own reputations. Detective Ford would meet with Omar Ballard in prison, intent on getting his full confession. Again, the police and prosecution's mantra had been, we don't have all of them yet, so he believed that Omar was the missing piece. All he needed was for Omar to state that all eight men had raped and murdered Michelle, and then the case could rest. But Omar refused to give the detective what he wanted. He told Ford exactly what happened, how Michelle let him into the apartment as he often stopped by looking for Tamika, and how he attacked her and killed her, and that no one else had been involved. Ford pressed him on his claim, repeatedly stating he knew that the other men had helped. But Ballard denied that outright, as he didn't know any of the other men who had been accused. Omar's confession matched the evidence to the letter, and the obvious next step would be for the police and prosecution to drop the case against all seven men who were falsely accused, but they couldn't do that. Again, Ford had already been reprimanded and demoted once for obtaining false confessions. The methods that he used in interrogations were frowned upon, and if the police were to drop the charges against all seven men, that would mean he had once again gained four false confessions for the sake of closing a case. That could be career-ending, and the entire Norfolk Police Department would be found to be complicit. So instead, they changed their theory about what had happened in the case. The prosecution would claim that the night of the attack, Daniel, Joe, Eric, Derek, John, Jeff, and Richard had all been hanging out in the parking lot of the apartment complex, talking about how they wanted to attack Michelle. They had planned to gain entry to her apartment and rape her. However, when they attempted to break in, they weren't able to. But while they were talking, Omar walked by. They asked the man if he would help them with their attack, to which Omar agreed. Somehow, he was able to gain entry into the home, at which point he let in the other seven men and they all raped and killed Michelle together. This theory cannot be true based on all the evidence at the scene, but that didn't matter. All that mattered was that the police found the DNA match, and they had four signed confessions in their back pockets. 
After hearing that Omar had confessed to the murder, Daniel Williams filed a motion to withdraw his guilty plea. Omar's confession aligned with the evidence. He had no affiliation with the men, and he felt as if his luck had finally turned around. But the court would deny his motion, and he would be sentenced to two life terms, without the possibility of parole. At this point, Joe Dick fully believed that he was responsible for the murder in some way, and when he was informed of Omar's confession, he immediately began parroting what Detective Ford told him about what had happened. The change of story would make the seventh version of events that he would give to the police, as he hardly knew what reality was at that point. He would go on to plead guilty, and would be sentenced to two life terms with the possibility of parole. Eric Wilson would attempt to fight the charges against him, believing that Omar's confession and the lack of evidence would exonerate him in court. To be clear, his confession did not match what the prosecution alleged occurred, and was so outdated that only two other men were said to have participated in Michelle's murder, but that didn't matter. A former member of the jury would tell the press that they had listened to the confession multiple times in the jury room, and they couldn't get over how he could claim to have done something he didn't do. Wilson would be convicted of rape and sentenced to eight and a half years in prison. Derek Tice would be prosecuted next. His lawyer would try to argue that he was innocent, and that Ballard had confessed to the crime alone. But the judge refused to allow any evidence showing as much in. He was barred from talking about Ballard's other assaults that occurred at the same apartment complex, and told not to question Ballard about the confession letter. Tice would be found guilty for both rape and murder, and sentenced to two life terms. However, in 2002, Derek would be granted an appeal, as the appeals court found that the judge in his case should have allowed for Ballard's confession to be allowed in. However, he would once again be found guilty and sentenced to two life terms. The prosecution would drop charges against Richard Polly, Jeff Ferris, and John Dancer due to lack of evidence, but would state that they still believed the men had been involved somehow. Ford would later state that all the men were involved, and those three got off on a technicality. But Ford couldn't let Omar Ballard go. The fact that he had confessed to the crime, but did so in a way that didn't match his own narrative, frustrated him. He needed the confession to match the story that he had told the prosecution to protect his own reputation, and so he approached Omar with a deal. He would make sure the death penalty would be taken off the table if Omar were to say the other men took part in the assault, and Omar agreed. The case would go on to receive major news attention, and over time, more and more experts agreed that the convictions in this case did not hold up to basic speculation. How had eight men gotten into a cramped apartment and only one of them left DNA? Why were their obvious alibis and answers overlooked for a convoluted, nonsensical theory? And why did no one seem to care that the convictions, as they were shown in court, could not have possibly been true? In 2004, three major law firms got involved with these cases and partnered with each of the men in pro bono. Upon looking at the case, the firms found countless examples of the police overlooking and ignoring direct evidence in favor of their theories, and noted that the police and prosecution had purposely withheld information from the men's lawyers. The legal team would go on to hire multiple experts to analyze the case, including Richard Offshe, a professor in sociology who specializes in confessions and interrogations. After looking over the case details and noting how each man spoke about their interviews with Detective Ford, Offshe would write a 56-page report detailing how the confessions in the case, Sans Omar's, had been false. They also commissioned a crime scene analysis and a reconstruction report, which validated what they already knew to be true. The rape and murder had been carried out by one frenzied individual, and it was impossible for eight people to have participated in said crime. In 2005, their lawyers would file petitions asking the governor of Virginia, Tim Kaine, to grant each of the accused absolute pardons. The petition included the previously cited reports, as well as others, all stating how it was impossible for anyone else but Omar to be responsible for the rape and murder. As they waited for the governor to make his decision, the legal teams continued their work by talking to members of the jury for Eric Wilson's trial. They then sent the following letter. We were members of the jury in the case of the Commonwealth v. Eric Wilson. We write to you to urge clemency to Eric Wilson and to three other young men, Joseph Dick, Derek Tice, and Daniel Williams, who were convicted of the brutal 1997 murder of Michelle Bosco. During Wilson's 1999 trial, we were asked to find that he participated with several other sailors in the rape and murder of Miss Bosco. The Commonwealth's evidence consisted largely of Wilson's statement to police made after a long interrogation and the not always consistent testimony of co-defendant Joseph Dick. By far, the most important evidence to the jury was Eric Wilson's confession. After carefully studying all the evidence, we reached a split verdict. 
we did not believe there was enough evidence that Wilson murdered or participated in the murder of Miss Bosco, and we found him not guilty on that charge, but we decided there was enough evidence to show that he participated in her sexual assault. Recently, we were asked by lawyers for Dick, Tice, and Williams to review additional evidence that we did not have before us at the Wilson trial. We have done so thoroughly and responsibly, and we think that the evidence is very important. It fills many of the holes we identified but had no evidence to fill, and places the evidence we did hear in a very different light. Taking this new information into account with the evidence we heard at trial, we now firmly believe that Wilson, Dick, Tice, and Williams are all innocent of this crime. We thus ask you to promptly clear the names of these innocent former sailors. The evidence that we did not hear points in only one direction, that none of these young men had anything to do with Miss Bosco's assault and murder. When we voted to convict Wilson of rape, we didn't know that. Detective Ford, the key investigator who got the confessions from the four Navy men, had earlier in his career obtained false confessions from other young men in multiple cases. The confessions of these four sailors were significantly inconsistent with each other and conflicted in so many ways with the known evidence of what actually happened to Miss Bosco. An expert in police interrogations and confessions has concluded that the confessions of these four sailors were coerced by the police and are false. Two additional sailors named by Derek Tice in his confession as being involved in the attack on Michelle Bosco and implicated by Joseph Dick in his testimony at Eric Wilson's trial actually had airtight alibis. Joseph Dick's supervisor believed that he was on his ship and not at Michelle Bosco's apartment complex on the night that Miss Bosco was murdered. Experienced experts in the crime scene reconstruction and in pathology have concluded that only one person committed this crime. We remember hearing evidence at the time of the trial that the apartment was neat and orderly and did not seem to have been disturbed by a large group of men, and that was a fact that troubled us during our deliberations. Omar Ballard violently assaulted another person in the same apartment complex where Michelle Bosco lived just two weeks before he killed Miss Bosco, and Omar Ballard raped and strangled a 14-year-old girl 10 days after raping Miss Bosco, just a short distance from Miss Bosco's apartment complex. Had we heard this evidence during the trial, we would not have convicted Eric Wilson of rape. Instead, we would have been convinced, as we are now, that Wilson and the three other sailors are innocent. All the available evidence shows clearly that Omar Ballard raped and killed Michelle Bosco by himself. We thus ask that you grant clemency to Joseph Dick, Derek Tice, Eric Wilson, and Daniel Williams. We recognize that we played a key role in putting Eric Wilson in prison, and we understand that you are now the only person who can clear his name and release the other innocent men. We were faced with a difficult decision when we deliberated, and we know that you're faced with a difficult decision too, but we believe that clearing the names of these four sailors is the only right thing to do and we urge you to act on these clemency petitions promptly. They also received support from other judges and prosecutors from across the country, who signed a letter similarly urging Governor Kane to grant the men clemency. However, Kane would not respond to the letters until 2009, where he ultimately decided to grant Williams, Dick, and Tice conditional pardons. Notably, Wilson had already served his eight-year sentence and was not included in the pardoning. Because the pardons were only conditional, the men were released from prison, but their convictions still stood, meaning that they would have to register as sex offenders and stay on probation. Outside of the prison, the men struggled with their new lives. In the eyes of the public, they were still guilty. They had a hard time gaining employment and reintegrating into society, because if anyone were to look into their lives, they would quickly find out that they were found guilty of rape and murder. However, in 2010, their luck would finally change for the better. The man solely responsible for cleaning their false confessions and destroying their lives, Robert Ford, would be brought up on extortion charges. It turns out that while he was making a career out of gaining false confessions and putting innocent people in prison, he was also padding his wallet by telling suspects that he could make their sentences lighter if they would pay him large quantities of money. The following is the U.S. Attorney's Office's public statement. The evidence presented at trial showed that in instances dating back to the 1990s, Ford obtained monetary payments exceeding $80,000 from and on behalf of individuals charged with criminal offenses. In return for helping them secure release on bond and sentence reductions by falsely representing to prosecutors and judges that those individuals provided assistance in the investigation of homicides in Norfolk, Ford also made false statements to federal agents during a voluntary interview conducted during an investigation. The evidence also showed that Ford used informants to fraudulently obtain money from Crimeline, a program funded by private donations to reward persons who provide tips to the police that help solve crimes. 
Robert would be found guilty, and all the cases he had worked on would be thrown into question, with Ford's reputation for corruption back in the spotlight, the Innocence Project, and the men's lawyers worked overtime to get their cases reviewed once more. If the men were truly to get justice for what had been done to them, they needed to get absolute pardons. It wouldn't be until 2017 when Governor Terry McAuliffe reviewed the case that the men's names would be cleared officially. As of today, all the men who are wrongfully accused of rape and murder are free, and have made millions of dollars in a settlement with the city of Norfolk in the state of Virginia. Meanwhile, Omar Ballard remains in prison for life where he belongs. Robert Ford was sentenced to 12 years in prison in 2011, and is likely a free man today. Day. His cases are still being reviewed today by multiple legal teams, as any confessions he garnered have rightfully been called into question, and there are likely more innocent men sitting in prison because of him. If you've made it to this portion of the video, thank you for watching. This topic was endlessly frustrating to research and write, as at every turn, the justice system failed. When the men were first exonerated, listening to Governor Kane state that he would not give them full pardons because, as he said, the confessions were super convincing was deeply aggravating. All of the evidence at the crime scene, all of the proof indicated that the police were wrong, but no one wanted to believe that. With that said, if there is a topic you would like to see us cover or a case you would like to bring more attention to, let us know by emailing us at dreading.official at gmail.com. If you would like to see more of our content, hit the subscribe button down below, and remember, stay safe.